Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? I said good morning. Well, we want to welcome you to our Inland Southern California for economic forecast, specific for North Orange County, Western Riverside County, and San Bernardino counties. We're so excited to welcome you here to our beautiful town of Corona, California. On behalf of the Corona Chamber, along with the Chino Valley Chamber, the Brea Chamber, and the Yorba Linda Chamber, we welcome you. Let's give a round of applause to each and every one of you for being here. Our four chambers have partnered together to bring this incredible opportunity to hear from what I call the economist, Dr. Chris Thornburg. He's got so much great information to share, and he will provide your company the resources needed to plan for success, to plan for the future. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's going to tell it like it is. We will begin today's luncheon with the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this time, what I'd like to see is if we could have anyone that is a veteran. Well, you guys are all standing, so that's okay. But anyone that's a veteran, please stand. <laughs> Testing. Okay. Stay standing. Stay standing. If you have someone that you know that was a veteran, please stand. If you are in this room, please stand. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome the chair of the Board of Supervisors for the, city, for the County of Riverside, the Honorable Karen Spiegel, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join with me in the 31 words that represent our freedoms and the opportunities that we have in this country. And let's say it together. I pledge allegiance. Yeah, you can clap for America. You can also clap for my wife. So she did an awesome job. Thank you, Karen. Well, events like this are only possible by the generosity of businesses and organizations that open up their wallets and become sponsors. At this time, we'd like to recognize and introduce our sponsors to you. You can also find information about our presenting, platinum, contributing, and elite sponsors at the exhibitor tables in the back. I'm very, very proud to introduce our presenting sponsor to all of you. That is United Paving. United Paving's mission, yeah, give them a round of applause. United Paving's mission is to be your paving contractor. United Paving has been serving Southern California, the entire region since 2000. Today representing United Paving is Tracy Moran. Ladies and gentlemen, show your love and respect for someone that stepped it up and did a big sponsorship today. For United Paving, welcome Tracy Moran. Thank you, Bobby, and good afternoon, everyone. It is afternoon, almost, still morning, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to be a sponsor of today's event. Uh, we've really enjoyed watching Dr. Thornburg speak over the years and um, the Corona Chamber and all the other chambers that are here today, thanks for your partnership in helping us businesses grow. Um, I am the Director of Marketing with United Paving Company. We're here in Corona. We have a full-service asphalt contracting company that builds for new construction projects, all the parking lots. We do street work. And we also take care of smaller businesses, too, with their ADA upgrades, asphalt repairs, seal coating, striping, concrete, um, and anything involved with your parking lot. So I just wanted to um, thank you for having us. We have quite a big team here, our VP, our um, general manager that's been here 21 years, 18 years, we're 21 years in business. Um, we have a growing team and we would just love to partner with you on anything that you may have within our community. We do serve the state of California. So if it's involved asphalt or concrete, please count on United Paving Company to help you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tracy. So in short, if you've got a problem, they've got your asphalt covered. So other sponsors are our platinum sponsors. And I just want to give a shout out to the Riverside County Office of Economic Development, as well as 
the county board of supervisors. They step, stepped it up in a big way. In fact, the flower arrangements today are courtesy of the Riverside County group. And I'm not sure how we're gonna divide those on up, but we'll figure that out and we'll announce it towards the end. But there's one on every table so you guys can all fight amongst yourself at the table. Additionally, we'd like to note our contributing sponsors, Shell Roofing Solutions. And you guys can clap as loud and get crazy. This is all about you guys. Tri-Counties Association of Realtors. Our elite sponsors are Accredited Tax, Inc., Herrera Energy, LLC, Albertson's Distribution Center, Altura Credit Union, Brea Gateway, Chevron, City of Brea, Cookies Retail, Corona Regional Medical Center, Entrepreneurial Operation System, Express Employment Professionals, Grant Romancia Photography, our photographer today, Greystone, HBT Labs, Kaiser Permanente, Nationwide Insurance, Republic Services, Rhythm Tech Productions that is doing our AV today, Riverside Medical Clinic, that is the quietest you guys have ever been. Thank you guys so much for your calmness, yeah. Sophie Cook Financial and Insurance Services, Southern California Gas Company, the Toll Roads of Orange County, Vulcan Materials Company, there you go, Waste Management, and Western States Financial Investments. Yeah, John and his cheering squad. Let's give a round of applause to all, all of those sponsors. So please welcome one of my chamber executive partners representing the Chino Valley Chamber, the president and CEO, Zeb Wellborn. And he is going to introduce our elected officials, dignitaries, and representatives. Zeb. All right, well thank you everybody for coming out today. Uh, when we announce our VIPs or elected officials, and we have a long list today, we do a, like a one-clap method. So can we practice this real quick? Give us a one-clap on three. One, two, three. Perfect. You guys nailed it. So you guys are set for this. Representing Congresswoman Young Kim, 39th Congressional District, Lynette Choi, District Director. <laughs> California State Assembly, Assembly Member Kelly Sayarto, 67th District. Representing Assembly Member Philip Chen, 55th District, Anthony Johnson. Representing Assembly Member Freddie Rodriguez, Scott Peltima. Representing California State Senator Josh Newman, Martin Madrano, and Erica Lucia. From the County of Riverside, Karen Spiegel, 2nd District, Board of Supervisors Chair. Well done. Chuck Washington, 3rd District, Board of Supervisors. Representing Orange County Supervisor Doug Chafee, Lachey Rodriguez. A city of Chino Mayor Pro Tem, Mark Lucio. And joining us from the city of Chino Hills, we have Brian Joes, Mayor. We have our city manager, Ben Montgomery. Assistant city manager, Rod Hill. From the city of Corona, we have Wes Speak. We have council member and former mayor, Jim Steiner. Former council member, Yolanda Carrillo. From the city of Murrieta, we have Deputy Director of Economic <laughs> Development, Scott Agajanian. Agajan Agajan Thank you. From the city of Norco, we have Mayor Kevin Bash. From the city of Palencia, we have Mayor Pro Tem Chad Vanke. 
From the city of Yorba Linda, we have Finance Director Diana Honeywell. And we have HR Director David Alba. And we would also like to recognize the CEO and presidents of various chambers in the area who are joining us today. From the Culver City Chamber, we have Colin Diaz. From the Greater San Fernando Valley Chamber, we have Nancy Hoffman Vanyak. From the Long Beach Chamber, we have Jeremy Harris. From the Murrieta and Wildemar Chamber, we have Patrick Ellis. And from the Santee Chamber, Kristen Dare. We also want to give a special shout out to all the chamber board members that are here. If you're a board member at one of our chambers, would you do me a favor and please stand? Thank you for all the work you do to support our business community and make us bigger, better, and stronger. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our team here today, so uh, myself, obviously, and the Corona Chamber President and CEO, Bobby Spiegel and team, the Brea Chamber President and CEO, Heidi Gallegos and team, and the Yorba Linda Chamber CEO, President Susan Wanross and the team for your partnership on putting, us, putting on this event. Let's give these guys a big round of applause. And then lastly, we know that this year has been a crazy, or the last 2020, 2021 has been a crazy wild year. So if you've been in business, or if you're in business, you know of somebody in business, you're an investor in a business, do me a favor, stand up. Can we do that? Can we stand up for a second? If you made it through 2020 and you made it through 2021, let's give yourselves a big round of applause. So you guys are all awesome. I want to say thank you. You're all VIPs in my book. And at this time, I would like to invite Heidi Gallegos, the president and CEO of the Brea Chamber, and Susan Wanross, president and CEO of the Yorba Linda Chamber, to the stage to present our special awards. Thank you very much, Zeb. Uh, just a little bit of background here on what occurred over the last year and how Chambers of Commerce were able to pull it together. I've never been more proud to be part of this industry. Um, at the very onset of the pandemic and the subsequent closures of business by government, members of the Greater San Fernando Valley Chamber be began contacting CEO Nancy Hoffman Vanek in dismay as they found out their business's interruption insurance was denied without even a simple review of the claim. I remember it was heartbreaking for many of my small businesses. Nancy immediately knew that this was not just a local problem, but a problem that would be felt across the state and even the country. She quickly called a few of her best chamber friends to find a solution to help businesses survive. Her first call was to her good friend, Patrick Ellis, President and CEO of the Murrieta Wildemar Chamber who she knew would jump into action right along her side. Nancy and Patrick were catalysts in mobilizing businesses, chambers of commerce, business organizations to aid in the recovery of the business community. They leveraged their relationships with elected officials to address both immediate and long-term needs. One standout partner was Assemblyman Adrian Nazarene, who Nancy credits with their advocacy efforts by backing, backing her up in March of 2020 and helping their efforts get off the ground. Their two-prong approach focused on guidance on accepted practices to restart the local economy and the adaptation and transformation of the future stability of the workforce and business resiliency through curated industry, regional, and complementary sector resources. Nancy and Patrick are exceptional at uniting people and their businesses towards community and a shared vision. In the face of lo looming business death, and, and that is not an understatement, folks, they convened chamber executives first in California, then nationwide, to discuss relief funding solutions for businesses affected by civil authority closures. What emerged was the Save Small Business Coalition. Now over 200 chambers and business organizations representing 28 states that's 28 states that they were able to pull together, committed to the survival of a vibrant business community in the face of severe economic hardships. Mobilizing the coalition's members, the SSBC continued to transform and adapt as they sought extraordinary emergency action by the government to empower an urgent solution that didn't exist. Now I'd like to bring up Susan, who's gonna share a little bit more about this story. Thank you, Heidi. 
as passionate leader for business growth and sustainability drove the SSBC's successful wins finding an advocate at the state level when our first path was California focused California State Assembly member Adrian Nazarian supported the coalition's efforts from the inception stating that small business is the backbone of our economy and it is vital to rebuilding the that economy once we defeat the COVID-19 virus and helped grow the coalition support among lawmakers in California Partnering with the International Council of Shopping Centers and the creation of the America's Recovery Fund Coalition. Together, the two coalitions highlighted that importance of providing relief for businesses that serve as a vital lifeline to our communities, workers, and local economies. The introduction of SSBC's bill, H.R. 7671, the Small Business Comeback Act, on Capitol Hill by Representatives Vila and Feilman establishing a one-click messaging platform that SSBC members could use to mobilize their business communities to contact their legislators to support programs that financially help businesses survive the pandemic. Partnering with Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks, and his EMES project and his COVID collaborative, collaborating with the U.S. Chamber and coalescing around four guiding principles for small business relief, PPP reform, workforce development, business liability protection, and local aid, state and local municipalities' financial support. The biggest win was Congress passing the relief bill, which included workforce development program, enhancing the payroll protection program, and additional local aid. This was a massive win for our small businesses. The relief bill was just a piece of the puzzle, and SSBC's work continues to help businesses recover from the pandemic and beyond. The Save Small Business Coalition was built on a passion and desire to create, seek, and support various catalytic methods of business growth and sustainability through the pandemic. They created a grassroots movement that sought solutions for the economic recovery and business resiliency in their communities, the state, and across the nation. The Save Small Business Coalition brought together organizations across the country that share similar values, interests and goals, allowing our coalition members to combine the resources and become more powerful than when they, reach, they each act alone. Their success has helped businesses receive funding, reopen their doors, and rehire workers. Please welcome Nancy Hoffman Vanyak and Patrick Ellis to the stage to accept the Small Business Advocate of the Year Award. So we didn't practice this part, so <laughs> Grant, tell us what to do. Thank you. So Nancy, do you want to say a word or two? Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Hoffman, then yeah. Well, look how sneaky you guys are getting my picture and everything from Fiumi at my office and calling my assembly member. That was like a kind of a shock. I actually need my glasses. Um, first of all, I really want to say, um, first of all, to, I'm sure, who coordinated this? Stephanie, thank you for putting me at table 13. For 34 years of my chamber, 33 years of my chamber career, I never have a table 13 because I'm superstitious, but last year told me it's lucky number 13. And I'm very lucky to be here with all of you today. Um, and I took a picture of it and sent it to my office because they will never believe that I sat at a table 13. <laughs> and also, um, as someone from the LA County, thank you for the green badge, meaning I'm open to handshakes, hugs, and what else am I open to? Everything. 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 Well, I don't know, not everything. So thank you for the green badge. <laughs> um, thank you, Corona Chamber, your Belinda Chamber, um, Chino Valley Chamber and Brea Chamber. This is so nice to be honored. You know, as chamber execs, Patrick and I and all of you, we are so used to being on the other side and not the ones being honored. And I cry. 
And I know that they went through a lot of effort to try and get us here, especially me, who left the Santa Clarita Valley to go through the San Fernando Valley to pick up Colin and Culver City, and I don't know how many other valleys I <laughs> went through to get here today. Um, but I'm really glad I could be here. So Bobby and um, Heidi and um, Susan and Zeb, thank you so much. You know, I didn't really know Zeb until we started the Save Small Business Coalition, and the one thing about Chambers, we work together so easily that when this all started and I called Patrick, it was a no-brainer. I didn't expect people to tell me no, because I pretty much voluntold them, voluntold that they were going to be part of this, and they all stepped up to the plate. Um, I also want to thank um, all of my, my leadership team, and who some of them are here today, Colin from the Culver City Chamber, who didn't know he was on the leadership team for two months, and <laughs> Jeremy Harris from the Long Beach Chamber, who, was the, who I called right alongside Patrick, um, to get this thing started. And my new friend, Kristen Dare, who she said, how come I didn't get invited to this party? And so now she's at my table today. Um, I want to thank, thank them because they pretty much just stood by my side when I was, said, we, gotta, we need to save small business. And I called Patrick, who I call my chamber husband, and I knew he wouldn't say no. I mean, I, I thought Jeremy would probably say no, but I knew Patrick wouldn't say no. I'm right. Right, and sure enough, we got together, that was on a Thursday, and on Tuesday, the Save Small Business Coalition was launched. But on that Thursday, I called my assembly member, Dream Nazarian, and I said, we got a problem with the insurance, um, with business interruption insurance, and his chief of staff, Dan Savage, was still in the Capitol, even though Sacramento was on a, just got their stay-at-home order. And Dan went to Commissioner Lara's office with me on his cell phone and put us on a conference call so we could start saving small business that day. And yeah, it was great. So um, I just want to give a big shout out to Adrin. He couldn't be here. It's recess and he's got a million kids and he wants to be with them <laughs> versus another lunch. But we had a nice long talk last night. And I want my, my coworker Femi couldn't be here, and she's really the brains behind all of this for us. I mean, she did all, her and Heather from Marietta did all of our marketing and materials, and without them, we couldn't have put this together. And I really need to thank, I have my board chair here and my past board chair, Stephen, Cindy, and my whole board who couldn't be here. Thank you, thank you for letting me storm the castle. Many times with Patrick, we stormed the castle many times, um, and entrusting me and all of our, all these chambers with the care and feeding of our business community. And I don't know how, I'm assuming all of us up here are very fortunate to have boards and chambers that let us ask forgiveness, not permission. So we can go out and do what we need to do in a timely manner so we could do stuff for you. So thank you so much. This was, this is a true honor. This is a beautiful award. Um, I need to find some wall space now. and. Um, but thank you for having us here, and I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Nancy is exactly right. Uh, usually when she calls, there's uh, two things uh, that come with that call. One is I have to talk her off the ledge of something, <laughs> or I have to say yes to something. And this was the say yes to something, uh, but it was the right yes at the right time. Um, Nancy kind of nailed it. I mean, as far as everything that took place, uh, what it took, uh, it was just the right thing to do. We had to do it because uh, if no one else is going to do it, it, we have to. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, small business is the core of everything that we do. Um, I do want to thank uh, my board, so I have my, my board chair and, and board member here, uh, without their uh, willingness to allow me to do crazy things like this, uh, things don't happen like that. Uh, I got to thank my staff. Um, that I always tell everyone, I go, I'm, I'm just the eye candy. They're the, they're the brains. So <laughs> they do all the work. I just look good. Um, uh, but I appreciate my staff immensely because it, without them, it would not have happened. So, uh, And I appreciate all all of my colleagues, um, because without them, the last year and a half would not have been possible. Uh, it is. It was crazy times for us in our industry. Uh, unfortunately, we lost a lot of people at two in our industry. Uh, so having our uh, relationships and our our text group, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night after a couple old fashions was very, very helpful. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Or thank you to everyone who made this possible, uh, and thank you all for what you do every day as business owners uh, and, and fighting the good fight because you guys make everything possible. So thank you. 
So I know lunch is being served, but what we're going to do is we're going to have our county supervisors. I believe that Karen and Chuck have proclamations to present. As well, we have some of the elected officials, the actual elected officials that have certificates, if you'd come on up. And you guys can go ahead and start your stuff here, but I'd like to have Karen and Chuck first come on up. Could you... Um, they, it's the wood ones, the framed ones. Karen, Chuck. So representing the County of Riverside, we've got two of our Board of Supervisors, the Honorable Karen Spiegel and the Honorable Chuck Washington. Well, I have the opportunity to present this proclamation to Nancy. And I don't want to go through the whole proclamation because if I read it, you guys would fall asleep. It's awfully long because this woman has achieved tremendous accomplishments. You want to read it? <laughs> you know, we look up to people, and each one of us has those that we look up to for various reasons. If you're a woman, you look up to women in leadership. If you're a man, you look at the different men that are in leadership positions. If various different things. Well, I'm favoring the woman today. Because women in leadership is growing. And I just want to give kudos to each and every one that has stepped up, that own your business, because we know you juggle a million things. Men do too, but some men do. <laughs> I had to make it lively, right? <laughs> we all juggle things, but I'll tell you, I know what Nancy's done. I've been there when Bobby's been on those calls, and... Um, what a go-getter, and what a cheerleader for others. And I think that's what really makes you so special, is you're being that cheerleader and not wanting the attention, but giving it to you, to those around you. And so with all these accomplishments, we look forward to seeing what more you're going to accomplish. Patrick, I can't compete with that. I love you, man. <laughs> um, okay, it's a bromance. I can say um, I experienced uh, serving on a board of directors for a chamber of commerce uh, back from 2000 to 2003, um, and uh, it was eye-opening. What I learned was that um, businesses really are the lifeblood of communities, and small businesses are the lifeblood of business, um, and. Um, I, I, I never am without that thought in my mind as I serve as a county supervisor, but previously as a city councilman in Temecula and before that in Murrieta. I, I love the Southwest Riverside County. Ten years ago, my wife and I bought a small business with our daughter and son-in-law. He, he has grown it fivefold through hard work. Sometimes my, my daughter complains that he works too hard um, and it's stressful. But um, owning your own business, th that comes with it. It's a labor of love. Uh, and so I know what goes into uh, making a small business succeed. My wife does our books uh, and watches the grandkids. So it's truly a family affair. So uh, mad love and respect for all of you out there uh, that help businesses and help small businesses succeed because com communities don't succeed without it. And there is no finer chamber leader than this man here, Patrick Ellis, and I'm happy to be up here with him today. Thank you, Patrick, for all that you do to make the Southwest a success. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And I think you want to get photos over there. Kelly? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for allowing me to come to this uh, great event and recognize Patrick, because that, uh, that opportunity doesn't come around very often. Right, Patrick? Not because he doesn't do great things. It's because uh, he's usually the one giving out awards. But, uh, but anyway, Patrick has been a valuable resource here in, in our city, in Murrieta, and also for me, as uh, I do the foray up into uh, to, uh, 
California, the, the assembly up there, because uh, there's a lot of bills up there that are not meant to help you guys and, and in fact hurt you guys. And, and Patrick is always there available for me to be able to uh, talk to and, and find out you know, how, how bills affect people on the ground. And uh, so I just want to congratulate Patrick on this uh, terrific recognition. Uh, I knew he'd be a guy who would step up and, and help during this pandemic and, uh, and try to help uh, small businesses recover and, and also succeed while the pandemic is happening. So, uh, so anyway, Patrick, congratulations on your award. And uh, thank you for being a good guy. I'm sorry, what? Oh, he didn't want, I guess I didn't announce who I was and what my title was. <laughs> I'm Kelly Ciarto, and I'm the assembly member for the 67th Assembly District. And I'm happy to call myself a friend of Patrick's, aside from being an associate and colleague at the city. Uh, so uh, worked with alongside Pac Patrick for a few years now, and uh, he's always uh, done a terrific job there in the chamber. And, uh, and now he just keeps outdoing himself. So Patrick, here you go. Thank you all so much. Enjoy your lunch as it's being served. We're going to take a short break right now. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and welcome back. I'd like to thank the staff at Eagle Glen Golf Club for their hospitality and the service this afternoon. I do know that some of you still have not gotten your meal. It is fresh, it is great, it's hot, and it's delicious. It will be served to you momentarily. But I would like to at this time share with you about another upcoming event that we are very honored to partner with chambers from throughout Southern California. It is the 10th annual Riverside County Women's Leadership Conference. Do we have a slide? And we're very excited to be able to share about this event, September 30th. It is a dynamic speaker lineup wrapped into an incredible half-day program. Please save the date for Thursday, September 30th. We invite you to join us. You can learn more about it by visiting in the back at the conference exhibitor booth. And you know, you can wear it a tiara, take a selfie because as I am told, and I've got high heel marks on my back from my wife. That didn't come out right. <laughs> We're going to cut that out of the video. So as I'm told that you can wear a tiara and take a selfie because real women fix each other's crowns. And as men, please note by attending, I guarantee you, you will learn more in this half day seminar than any other seminar you could attend. Real men attend the Women's Leadership Conference. So with that, I would like to at this time bring up Tracy, who is our sponsor, our presenting sponsor from United Paving, and she is going to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Bobby. Hello again. It gives me a great deal of pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Thornburg. Dr. Thornburg has founded Beacon Economics LLC in 2006. Under his leadership, the firm has become one of the most respected research organizations in California, serving public and private sector clients across the United States. In 2015, Dr. Thornburg also became director of the UC Riverside School of Business Center for Economic Forecasting and Development and an adjunct professor, professor at the school. An expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, economic policy, and labor and real estate markets, Dr. Thornburg has consulted for private industries, cities, counties, and public agencies. He became nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage market crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. In 2015, he was named to California State Treasurer John Chang's Council of Economic Advisors, the body that advises the treasurer on emerging strengths and vulnerabilities within the state's economy. Dr. Thornburg holds a PhD in business economics from the Anderson School, of, uh, school at UCLA and a BS in administration from the State University 
of New York at Buffalo. Please welcome Dr. Christopher Thornburg. can't hear myself. Are you sure? Okay. Anyway. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Swallow your food. Reply. Be nice, for God's sake. Um, it's, it's obviously great to be here. Uh, it's great, obviously, to be here working with these chambers. It's great to see people. That's exciting all by itself. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I obviously knew this was a talk for a coalition of chambers, chambers I know I've worked with before. I didn't realize we were going to have uh, the awards and so many other chamber folks here. And, you know, I, I should probably start this out with, you know, just look, we live in a world which is becoming increasingly disengaged. <laughs> Ooh, how are we doing, guys? We got that under control? All right. Um, we live in a world which is obviously becoming increasingly disengaged with what I call ground level reality. Um, and we live in a world where the public discourse seems ambivalent, if not outright hostile, to the needs of business and really completely unappreciative in, of the, the so many important things that business does for us on a day to day basis in this nation. And, you know, it's the chambers who are the front line in that fight. Um, you know, when you think about this, you got to realize you, you, you're never going to win this battle. There is no blitzkrieg that's going to make it all right. Um, it's all about narrative. It's all about the stories. It's all about the message. And it's your chambers who carry that narrative, who carry that message, who get it out there. So I probably should start by thanking the chambers for the incredibly important work they do. Thank you to the people here who are work with these chambers and and if you're in this room and you're not a member of a chamber uh you do something about that like yesterday okay <laughs> all right so uh with that in mind let's talk about the economy um because that's really what we want to talk about and um wow i mean kind of an interesting couple of years to say the least uh and I, it, it, <sighs> are we okay i mean how am i gonna do you, do you need me to Stand someplace or not? Are we good? All right. I have moved. I'm, hopefully, this won't be a problem. But um, so, uh, where, where do you start, right? Well, I, I want to start with the cognitive dissonance that's in our headlines on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, have you noticed this? Here, here's two headlines I saw on the same day: Workers in 25 states braced for early retire unemployment shutoff. I have 88 cents in my bank account. At the same time. Job openings set record of 9.3 million. How, how, how do you have those two headlines next to each other? What am I missing, right? Or, or here's another one. California defies boom with the number one U.S. economy. Yet at the same time, according to PolicyLink, we have an eviction tsunami coming upon our shores any minute now. Again, how do we square this? What's going on out there? Well. This, of course, has a lot to do with, yet again, the politics and, and how the politics has, in some ways, grabbed what's been going on. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's using it to pursue goals that are long run. And, and unfortunately, the views they've grabbed of what's happening are, are largely wrong. Um, and Really, what I'm trying to get to you today is, is to give you a better sense of what is actually happening out there. So when you're looking at these headlines, you're going to see what's actually going on. And with that in mind, I have a few big themes, right? And I apologize for the small text here. I probably ought to figure out how to shrink this down. But, you know, look, there's no doubt the last year and a half of COVID has been a tragic natural disaster. There's no doubt about it. You have to, your hearts have to go out to the millions of families who've lost loved ones across the globe. Obviously, it's been brutal. But at the same time, as tragic as natural disasters are, history is pretty clear. They do not have long-run economic consequences. They don't. In other words, as bad as this was, it was never going to be a long-term recession. It was a completely different kind of recession than what we've seen in the past. And candidly, no matter what the government did or didn't do, we were going to be back up and running quick. Now, with that in mind, again, 
the, the, the interesting thing about the Great Recession versus the pandemic recession was that one started about six months before and the other one started about six months after an election. And what a difference that makes, right? Back then, the election was done, the two parties went at loggerheads, and we didn't get anywhere near enough stimulus that this nation needed in the face of incredibly adverse circumstances in the back end of that collapse. This time around, it happened six months before the election. And of course, what you saw was one of the most frenetic efforts to put money into the economy you've ever seen. The amount of stimulus that went into this economy over the course of the last year has been insane. I mean, it just over the top. Now, mind you, it's taken what was already going to be a fast recovery and made it even a little faster. But with that in mind, it is also going to be creating dangerous instabilities in our economy over the next five, six, seven years. And candidly, it's worsening some of the long-run problems we're having in the U.S. economy. So it's not something to sit around and feel good about. No, we didn't do the right thing. We're actually creating ultimately more problems than, than we're solving by doing what we're doing. And again, that's a big part of what happens over the next few years. Um, as for the recession itself, I don't know if you caught this, but the MBER finally came out with their wonderful backcast and told us when the pandemic recession ended, which, by the way, was exactly what I've been saying all along. Yes, this was the deepest recession in U.S. economic history. It was also the shortest. It was two months. Two months. Started in February, ended in <coughs> May. I'm sorry. Wait, that's not two months. Started in February, ended in April. Recovery began in May. Um, two months, that's it. Now, mind you, we measure recessions top to bottom, right? So, for example, the Great Recession was a year and a half. This one was two months. But the real measure of the business cycle isn't just down. It's also when do you get back to where you were pre-recession, right? Now, in the case of the Great Recession, that was seven and a half years. The full length of the Great Recession business cycle was nine years. By the way... We're already done. As of June, the output gap that formed at the beginning of this thing has already been erased. And by the way, the high growth rates we're seeing right now are going to continue for at least a year and a half. Our economy is vastly overheated. It's vastly overheated. Um, now, I know that seems weird because you look across the economy and you say, well, but I know that business is still trying to get it under its feet underneath it. How can you say that you know, things are OK. But it's, it's, what, I, what I mean by this is, you got to remember, it's not an even recovery. You have some parts of the economy that are still trying to recover. What we're not paying attention to is the parts of the economy that are way ahead, right? They're performing way over what they normally would. On net, <coughs> you add it all up, the economy is back to where it was. But we still see, obviously, some signs of distress. Um, and of course, as much as we can appreciate that some households continue to, to, to obviously struggle, I mean, there's always a degree of, of, of a share of, of families in the United States that struggle, and that's more than, than normal. But at the same time, if you take a step back and you look at the whole of the U.S. population, here's the reality. People have never been quite as good as off as they are right now. Now, again, that's completely different than the headlines you see on a day-to-day -day basis. We're, we're still being told about how an enormous share of the population is suffering. No, they're not, OK? And we need to take a step back from that statement, because that is not the issue. Indeed, I would argue that a lot of our worries about workers and growing inequality and the problems we had are actually going to be disappearing rapidly over the last couple of years, in large part because of what this pandemic has done. Um, housing, no, it's not a bubble. <laughs> Yes, we still have a supply problem. We'll come to that, too. But what this all adds up to, of course, very simply, is this. Um, it is time, it is time for our state, it is time for our nation to stop pretending we have a crisis. The crisis is behind us. It is now, and, and not to say we just say, OK, we're done, we're, we're walking away. Obviously, you still continue to use efforts in the narrow parts of our economy, the very <coughs> narrow parts of our economy that still need help. But it's time to get back to having the long-run conversations, which we're not having. And whether that's national about the debt, whether that's local about the housing supply, it is time to drop the crisis banner 
and move on. Because the longer we continue to ignore the long run challenges, the worse those long run challenges are going to come back to haunt us. So that's, that's, that's the big message, okay, right there in a nutshell. Now, of course, as if you've seen me talk before, I'm now going to go breeze through about 60 slides of data, so buckle up, <laughs> um, that all kind of give you the idea of, of why I think this and why I think the way I do. And, and at the end, we're going to have some time for some Q&A so you can, you can push back as, as the need would be. Now, again, let's go back to where we were last March or, or last April. Um, and I was, I was, it was pointed out to me the last time I talked to this group, I said at my last slide, and oh, by the way, there's this COVID thing. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't, right? I don't think anybody really did. But it did hit. It did come, and we, everybody had to take a step back. I remember sitting in my office with my folks, and Trevor was trying to figure out what does this mean? Where is this going? I had a particular mindset because, again, I view this as a natural disaster. And as a guy who studied natural disasters in the past, I go, okay, it's a serious, it's tragic, but it's not long run. Now, that's not what you heard, right? The vast majority of the conversation out there was, this is horrible. 10 years scarring of the labor market. Worst downturn ever. I, <clears throat> I love this. This is one of my former colleagues at UCLA. Make no mistake, this has morphed into a depression-like crisis, which I, I just wanted to have a time machine to send him back to a, the depression to see what a depression actually looked like. <laughs> now. You know, I, I get it. It's a nice way of getting your name in the headlines. If you like to see your name and up in the top of the LA Times, you say this kind of stuff. Candidly, this is, it's, it's, it's awful. It's awful because it did get people panicked. It did make people worried, despite the fact that none of this rhetoric was correct. It, look, why was this not the Great Recession? Why was it so different? Why was the V the only logical outcome? Well, think about it. First of all, there was a pre-recession. The Great Recession didn't come out of nowhere. The Great Recession happened because for the four or five years prior to the Great Recession, we were in the midst of this insane subprime borrowing binge. The US economy was incredibly overheated by the vast amount of bad debt that was pouring into American households. Um, no matter how good the economy felt in 2006, it was rotten to the core, which is exactly why in 2006 I was saying the things I was saying, right? This time around, despite all our negative rhetoric about the economy, here's the reality. <clears throat> From about 2014 to 2020, our economy was doing great. Labor markets were at 50 year <clears throat> to levels of tightness. You had wage, wa wages were going up. And yes, things were slow a little bit because of a, some issues with rising interest rates and the trade war with China, but our economy was in great shape. Households were in great shape. <clears throat> Back then, remember, we came into it with households having a tremendous amount of debt, particularly households that really shouldn't have had all that debt. And of course, when all the wealth they thought they had disappeared when the bubble collapsed, suddenly you had a big problem on your hands, right? This time around, we came into the pandemic with households way better off. We were at a 30-year high in savings rates. We had a, the lowest financial obligations ratio, the share of income being spent on debt ever since we started collecting this data in the 70s. And that's not just rich people. It was across the board. Again, people were way better able to handle a shock to the system now than then. But the most important part was the recession driver itself. And this is what people really got wrong, right? Look, the Great Recession was a demand shock. Now, what I mean by that is people stopped going to restaurants in 2010 because they couldn't afford to. Oh, hell, you know, my house is down 30% in value. I got this huge mortgage. We can't afford to go out and eat, right? We, we can't. Now, obviously, certain parts of the economy, the, house, uh, the uh, consumer finance, housing, construction, got hammered, but it was a general problem. Everybody suffered because there was a general decline in demand because of this balance sheet issue. And on top of that, banks had a big balance sheet issue. That was bad debt, and they were trying to rebuild, right? So you had a general problem across the entire economy. It took years to recover from. This time around, in 2020, people didn't stop going to restaurants because they couldn't afford to. They stopped going to restaurants because they weren't allowed to. Now, that seems like a small difference, but for an economist standpoint, that's huge. Why? Because if I can't go to the restaurant, I'm going to do something else with this cash. 
And that's exactly what they did. They went out to other parts of the economy and spent it on other things. Yes, there was a hit here, and that hit turned into excess demand here. And that, by the way, balanced this out in a way that did not happen during the Great Recession. A completely different kind of shock. One, of course, that didn't have anywhere near the profound impact on the U.S. economy. So the economy has come roaring back. As noted, two months, a huge decline, deepest ever. In two months, we already started rocketing back. People mitigated. Okay, I get it now. I understand what Corona is. I understand how I can live my life and how I can't live my life. And I'm going to get back to the business of spending, which they did. Rocketed back. Third quarter growth, huge. Now it's stalled a little bit in the fourth quarter. Worst surge in the number of new cases to date. Stalled a little bit. But we're right back into recovery mode. And as of, by the way, the second quarter of this year, we're looking at about an 8% growth rate, which pretty much, well, it's coming out in a week or so, and it will pretty much erase the rest of the output gap. So, again, great recession, nine years beginning to end. This recession, not even a year and a half. That's how quick it was. Completely different kind of picture than what we saw last time. But as noted, not an even recovery. This is consumer spending on the left-hand side here by different types of spending. Um, services, which includes Disneyland and hotels and restaurants, still below where it was pre-pandemic, but good spending through the roof, right? Again, hey, we can't go to Disneyland, let's buy a camper, which costs about the same, right? Um, <laughs> it does, I have kids, trust me, right? Um, and, and that's what's going on, and boy, if you didn't believe me, I, you know, uh, anybody try to buy a bike last Christmas? Right? Right? I, I, you know, I, I, had, I had an old hot tub and I was going to replace it. Oh, I got nothing. Oh, I still got the hot tub replaced. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> Yo, you can get a hot tub. When are we going to deliver it? I don't know, 2024, maybe? <laughs> okay. Um, not what I was anticipating. Oh, and that's true regionally as well, by the way, right? Again, the story about, about the inland parts of the state is always the same. Oh, you poor suckers and your horrible, squalid little lives in the center part of the state. If only you could be like us coastal economies, maybe your lives wouldn't be so horrible, right? It's, it's kind of nonsense you're constantly being told out here. It's preposterous, right? Absolutely preposterous. This has been the growth margin state. And yeah, the interim parts of the state got hit harder in the Great Recession because there was a lot more of that bad debt out here. But this time around, again, different kind of recession, different type of situation. It was the coastal economies that got pummeled because remember, the hit here wasn't driven by local spending. Local spending remained strong once we got over that first couple months. This time around, it was all about that global tourism. So San Francisco hammered, Anaheim hammered. LA got hit with tourism and the fact that the movie industry stopped making movies. They got pummeled. Inland parts of the state, what recession, right? Sure, things are a little funky, but hey, think, you know, people are going out, people are having fun. Um, Things were happening out here. So actually, the interim parts of the state were by far and away the strong parts of the state. And that bifurcated recovery, by the way, also can go within counties, right? Yes, Anaheim got hammered. Anybody go to Dana Point over the last year? <laughs> the hotels down there were packed, right? Because again, if you could drive to it, you did. If you could fly to it, you didn't, right? That was a very simple rule. So, um, and you can see the data out here for the Inland Empire, how good those numbers are. Above trend, two quarters down, two quarters above trend. So almost no hit to taxable sales here. San Francisco's taxable sales are still down 30% from where they were pre-pandemic. Now I know I should feel bad about that, but for some reason I don't. I don't know why. <laughs> so, of course, with goods trade coming back, industrial production came roaring back. <coughs> Again, look at the difference between the Great Recession and this one, right? So profoundly different as the case may be. And indeed, it's a little wobbly, but it's not because of a lack of demand. It's because of, of the supply chain problems. No one was anticipating this. <clears throat> Trade is still down, but that's all services. The good side is right back to where it was pre-pandemic. Within months, it came back. I, I was talking to, uh, where's my Long Beach chamber guy? Yeah, there you are. So we were talking about all the boats still parked outside his house, right? He's getting to, he's getting to know the, the, the captains. You know, they come in for coffee in the morning, right? Bring the dinghy in. Um, so, you know, again, because not, not necessarily because it's that high, because nobody was prepared. Hey, hey, I was a depression. I was supposed to mothball my ships, right? Well, no, <laughs> as it turns out, because it's not a depression. And of course, you're certainly seeing that in terms of prices. Look at producer price indices, right, through the roof. You know, total supply chain problems across the board, because nobody was prepared. And by the way, it, it, there's a two-part problem here that's worth noting. 
I mean, the first part is that, yeah, we were told it was depression. You went into depression mode. And, and look, businesses have to, they have to make forecasts. And they listened to the quote-unquote experts who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And they planned for a depression. It didn't happen. And, and they were like, oh, my God, i got to ramp up. And i got to reopen plants. And i got to do all this stuff. And it takes time. But the other part of it is remember that there was never that much capacity because like durable goods sales is way above trend. This system was never meant to sell that much product in that short period of time. So both of these are constraining things and we're still trying to get out. If you think this is gonna end, take a look at the right hand side. This is inventory to sales ratios in retail. Look how low that is. They're still trying to restock the shelves. And then I have autos in there, which is crazy. There's a reason that used car prices are going through the roof because there's hard to buy a car right now, right? Now, I'm feeling very fortunate because I bought my brand new Ford last July, so I'm feeling pretty smart. Random, but, you know. Um, and, of course, you see it out here in terms of logistics. The, the, the overall air of freight through Ontario is crazy. The international airports had a record year last year. Um, and you certainly see it in terms of the industrial space, which is doing glorious. Now, we'll, we'll come back to industrial in a few minutes. There's another part of this, which is about profits. Because, again, it, Yes, I know, some businesses got hit, but other ones did really well. So we had the one big quarter of hit, right? That second quarter of last year was gory. Profits were way down. When nobody talks about the second half of last year, highest corporate profits ever. Now again, keep that in the back of your mind. Yes, I know these businesses are suffering, but overall profits are the best, highest they've ever been. Again, what we're not talking about is all these folks over here who are making money hand over fist because their economy is doing great. And that's important because those folks were hiring people and paying people and doing all the things that support our economy. And of course, lo and behold, with that strong profit, business investment was good too. Now again, not overall. Stuff like uh, uh, mining was way down, manufacturing was down. On the other hand, computers, information technology, residential structure, software, all way up. And by the way, those are very important drivers of California's economy. There's a reason that Gavin Newsom is sitting on top of this enormous surplus because our economy has actually, from an income perspective, benefited quite a bit from everything that's been going on. Venture capital had a great year across the state. Even out here in the Inland Empire, they did great. And now, of course, we have the added benefit of the vaccines coming out, and of course, what has been up to the last few weeks, a complete collapse in the number of new cases. The stuff that couldn't reopen is starting to reopen. The, the parks are reopening. Uh, people are flying again. And, you know, this is getting more and more intense as you go on. Uh, the airport's picking up. Consumer spending across the areas. The airports are starting to get busy again. Um, hotels are busy again. Uh, the American uh, uh, Travel Association put out a survey not too long ago. And lo and behold, hardly a surprise, you know, what are you going to do when the pandemic is over? Every single human being said, I'm going to travel. So if you take nothing away from a forecast today, go home, get on Expedia, and book all your tickets for the next two years because they're only going to get more expensive, okay? Um, just, you know, get used to it. Now, obviously, we are seeing the resurgence in cases. We got the Delta variant, which is more contagious. We have a certain amount of people uh, in this nation, for whatever reason, won't get vaccinated. Um, now, yeah, okay, the press is having a field day. It's another crisis. Everybody's panicking again. Okay, look, it's, it's going up, but it's nowhere near what it was, and it will never can be enough because a huge pair of the population is already vaccinated and aren't going to have a problem. And what's, noted, what's noting is we have an increase in cases, but remember, some of these cases are people who have been vaccinated, and they don't even know they're sick, <laughs> right? Because that's the beauty for the vaccine. You, you don't even know you have the damn thing, right? Because um, it doesn't bother you. Number of hospitalizations are up a little bit, but deaths are still way, way down. So no, it's not where we were a year ago, um, um, newspapers. It's not. It's, it's not that serious. And candidly, people get vaccinated, and even this would go away. But, you know, so don't panic about it. But, but <laughs> you know, but, but then uh, this is the stuff that makes me crazy. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a second. Now, of course, the question then, and I've already made this point, but well, how much of this had to do with all the stimulus, right? And it's easy to say, oh, well, the government did the right thing. They, they rescued the economy. <clears throat> not really, right? Not really. Now, there's no doubt they put a lot of money in. Five trillion dollars <clears throat> between plan one, two, and three. Five trillion dollars in fiscal stimulus. Wow. All right. I mean, that's, you know, that's serious cash, people, okay? Five trillion just lobbed at the economy. And it wasn't targeted, right? This is just a fire hose. Yeah, they're going to put it everywhere. Um, 
you know, take, take for example, the stimulus checks. Oh, they're very popular. Everybody loves the stimulus check. But keep in mind, even at the worst, right, we have maybe 10, 11 million people unemployed. 120 million people are getting stimulus checks. 110 million people are getting stimulus checks. So think about that. Okay, for the 10 million people who lost their job, I'm glad they got the stimulus check. I'm sure it helped. I'm great. But what about the other 100 million people? Those people didn't have a problem. They were working. They never lost their job. They never lost their hours. In fact, pay raises were pretty damn good last year because, again, the parts of the economy were opening and doing so well. You know, if you were working at a Home Depot, you had mucho hours going on. You know what I mean? Um, your problem was that you didn't have money. Your problem was you couldn't spend it. Giving people money they can't spend doesn't help anybody, okay? Oh, except for the banking system, because guess where all that cash went? It saved. It paid down debt. And that's not stimulus, folks. That doesn't help anybody. In fact, amazingly, only, only according to the survey, only about 15% of the money was spent on essentials. 85% wasn't. Again, what are we doing? And that's just the stimulus checks. The PPP loans, even worse. Just billions of dollars going to businesses. How many law firms got a PPP loan? Right? Excuse me? <laughs> the hell's going on? <laughs> but again, everybody loves free money. Right? Everybody loves free money. And you can see it. Five, five trillion dollars in stimulus, right? Put that in the back of your mind. Three trillion dollars in additional bank deposits. Three trillion in additional bank deposits. So 60% of it just ended up in the bank. The rest of it ended up in stocks and in homes and in all sorts of stuff. Very little of it actually was stimulus. Um, and you can see it. I mean, take a look for, and we know, listen, we know it helps in, in, in ways that are important. For example, we're all worried about low income families. They're always the ones who are at the front line of these things. They take the brunt of the event. Well, by the way, they're doing great. Take a, take a look at the left-hand side. This is data from the Dallas Fed. Um, this is average checking account balance for the bottom 50% of earners. Through the roof. Over doubled. Over doubled. Now, again, do they need the cash? Hell yeah. It, am I glad they have it? I am. Yes, I am. But uh, again, don't keep telling me how terrible things are when there's all sorts of statistics that say they're doing pretty well. Right? Spending. Spending for low-income families is higher now relative to pre-pandemic than for high-income families. You've seen more growth rate in spending for low-income families than high-income families. Now again, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is ignoring that and constantly running around telling everybody how terrible everything is when it's pretty clear it's not. And by the way, I, I'm not telling you to feel sorry for high-income families either, okay? Because they're just waiting for Paris to reopen, okay? <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's a different conversation. So we shouldn't feel bad about that either. But again, things aren't that bad. And of course, here's another place the money went. Uh, the portion of respondents invested in the stock market, particularly the under 35 crowd, 70%, right? Mainly through Robinhood, which is a conversation which I can just, again, blows my mind, okay? Um, and, and with all that money pouring around, stock market. Second highest P-E ratio ever seen. Higher than prior to the Great Depression, almost as high as prior to the dot-com bust. Again, when you have all that money, this happens. The market's through the roof. Now, it, it's been volatile lately. And, and this is, again, this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of stuff that literally, I'm driving down the highway and I hear this on the radio and I have to pull over, open the windows and scream at the world for like 20 minutes, okay? It, it, when it went, this, I love this. Stocks sink on yields tumble as COVID-19 fears circle the world. Really? I, I'm sorry, folks. Did I not just point out in the second half of last year we had the worst, worst surge of the virus, the worst number of new deaths, and corporate profits were at an all-time high level? D did I not just point that out to you? If anything, if this was a real surge, corporate stocks should be going up, not down, right? Because it, clearly it's good for profits. Well, what are we talking about? But this is the nonsense that passes for news. This is what they, they spit at you through the radio on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's just so clueless. It's so clueless. So don't listen to this stuff. Don't listen to this garbage Monday morning quarterbacking. Yeah, exactly. It's just nonsense. 
Um, and of course, it's not free money. It, 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 we're, we already borrowed. This na- and remember, we already came into this with a problem. Last year, we came into the year before COVID was a thing with a trillion dollar deficit. A trillion dollar deficit in the 11th year of an expansion incredibly, incredibly healthy US economy. A trillion dollars. That was already obnoxious. And they go, hey, let's just toss a few more trillion at it. We've already borrowed 5.5 trillion to date. We're talking another two to three trillion over the next year and a half. Eight, nine trillion dollars in debt. We're supposed to be preparing for the problems of Medicare and Social Security. Remember those, those programs that are not sustainable, not all the boomers are retiring? And as opposed to thinking about fixing the problem, we're like running at the problem as fast as we can. There's a, where there's a giant rock in front of us and we're, we're, on, we're on the gas pedal accelerating as fast as we can. It's incredibly irresponsible. And remember what we're doing, okay? Take a look at the left-hand side. Remember the, high financial, uh, the household financial obligations, right? This is the percent of household income spent on your debt, on your rent, on your credit, your student loans. And yeah, it was record high before the Great Recession. It came down sharply afterwards and was very low because people weren't picking up a lot of debt. Interest rates were low. People were doing great. And then in the last year, because of all this free money, that has absolutely collapsed to lower than we've ever seen it before. Folks, we are rich, right? We're doing great. Who isn't? Oh, yeah, the people we're leaving this trillion dollars of debt for our kids and grandkids. Remember them? They're the ones holding the bag on this. This isn't stimulus. This is intergenerational warfare. And again, no one's talking about it. No one's talking about it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, with all this good news outside the debt, you have to ask the labor markets. Wait a minute, Chris. The economy's back. People are doing great. Incomes are up. Spending's good. The job market looks terrible. We're down 7 million payroll jobs. The unemployment rate uh, is still, you know, five, well, five, six percent. It didn't fall last month. Oh my God. Now, how do you square these two things? Well, you know, this is the same picture here, right? California's jobs are way below where they were pre pandemic, and unemployment rate in the state is still eight percent. It was a little above four percent. So the numbers don't look very good, right? And that's particularly true in leisure and hospitality, other services, education, government. This is where a huge part of the problems still lie. Regionally, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, Orange County, all way down on jobs. Again, the inland parts of the state, much better. Inland Empire, for example, about 4.6% down, but you know, relative to everybody else, that's pretty good, but still down a lot of jobs. So how, how can we have this horrible labor market while the economy looks so good? Well, you gotta take a step back, because remember, you can't just look at the labor market and say, that's good or bad. Labor market is an equilibrium, okay? It's an equilibrium between the demand for labor and the supply of labor. And yeah, you may be down jobs because there's weak demand for labor, but guess what? You may be down jobs because there's weak supply of labor. And you have to have that conversation. What does this mean? Is it demand or is it supply? Well, take a look at job openings. 10 million now, 10 million. The highest, before the pandemic, the highest we ever hit was a little over 7 million job openings. We now have 10 million job openings in the US economy. Businesses can't hire. Who is there who, having problems hiring people, filling spots in your business? Right? I am. It's crazy. So you, you, with that basic statistic, you start to say, well, maybe, maybe this isn't demand. Maybe this isn't a worker problem. Maybe this is a business problem. Now, another bit of evidence on that is total quits. This, this jolt survey, we also know how many people are voluntarily quitting. By the way, that is also at a all time high level. That's not something workers do when they're worried about getting another job. But right now, they are walking as fast as they want to, right? They're not worried because, again, the labor market's great. Now, what's causing these labor shortages? Some are skill mismatches. Look, you're not going to take a busboy and turn him into a factory worker. I appreciate that. You got to, there's some time involved there. Um, there's just basic, just coordination and clearing, which takes time. Um, But not all these people who are unemployed are actually unemployed. You know, a whole bunch of these people are unemployed, but they're still in temporary layoff. That means you're not looking for a job. You're just waiting for your job to come back. That's still a high number. And yes, 
there's the high unemployment payments, right? We all heard about that. They're turning them off. Make those lazy punks work. Again, take a step back, folks, okay? Now, I appreciate there's no doubt that high unemployment, people have a money in the bank. Yeah, maybe they're not rushing out to grab the first job. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. Look, you want people to look for jobs that offer them career options, that offer them a ladder. If you're, just, if you're panicked about putting food on the table, you're going to take whatever job's in front of you, and very often that decision to put food on the table right now may actually have bad consequences for your life in the long run. If you have a little space, a little time, you're going to look for the job that's going to offer you and your family a future. So what I would argue is, no doubt, no doubt, there are some people out there who don't want to work. I'm sure that exists. But I think a lot more people don't want to work here. See how that, see how that differs? All right? So, you know, that's something employers have to think about. Now, the other part of it, of course, is long-run issues. Because, yes, you saw a short run, but remember, we came into this with labor shortage problems already. We already were seeing problems because of the labor force shrinkage, because boomers are starting to retire, because of the basic demographic jobs, because of the collapse in immigration, given the antipathy held towards immigrants by the, particularly the last administration. And these are all problems even before we got into this. We got into this, and of course, a bunch of people retired. Now, if you add it all up, you, you can see where this leads us, right? Uh, labor force. Uh, because of demographic changes, right, over the last couple of years, we had, uh, we had a slowing growth in working age population. Now we're negative. It's actually shrinking. It's kind of a problem, right? And we know the baby collapse is, is even more profound at this point in time. There are fewer and fewer babies out there. Um, retirees, a couple million people retired. Again, hey man, I hear it's a depression. Ten years, screw it, I'm retiring now. A lot of them did. That's a big problem, right? Because they're not there. Um, you have the temporary layoff, as already noted on the left-hand side here. And the unemployment payments has already, has already added up. Now, what does it all mean? What, what's going on out here? Well, take, take a look at this. The current unemployment is 9.3 million, actually a little less than about 9.2 million now. Um, now, to put this in context, you can't just look at that number. One of the things that made me crazy is when you would, you would like listen to the radio and you'd have some journalists and they would be like, I gotta get, the, I gotta get it right, it's gotta be breathless. <laughs> Millions of people are unemployed, right? To which I say, hey, you remember um, January 2020, the unemployment rate was 3.5%. It was the tightest labor market in 50, 50, in 50 years. By the way, in that tightest labor market in 50 years, millions of people are unemployed, okay? <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> We've got it's a big country, people, okay? You're going to have a million of people unemployed. This is how it is. Uh, it was 5.75. So you're really looking at oh, maybe a little, about 3.5, 4 million excess unemployed. Okay? Now of those, um, about 1 million are in temporary layoff, uh, about 3.5 million have dropped out of the workforce, of which well over two-thirds have retired. Um, and if you add it all up, what you have right now in the U.S. is basically nine, no, almost 10 million jobs now, uh, with 2.5 million people available for them. And of course, maybe 1.5 million people on the edge who could come back in the labor force if their kids can go to school again, right? So, You've never seen this kind of mismatch between job openings and people looking for work. Now, to be clear, for every business in this room, this isn't going away. It, it's going to get better. People will come out of retirement. Some people are going to be able to get out of the home again. But in general, this is a problem you're going to face for a while. So everybody here has to start thinking right now, what kind of investments do I need to make in my organization that I don't need as many people to do the things I need to do. Just get used to it. This isn't changing. Um, and to be clear, here's another thing that made me a little crazy. You, you, I'm sorry, I sound like I'm just, I'm, sound, I'm sounding more and more like my dad, right? Um, but uh, you, you, you all heard the K-shape, right? Well, this is a K-shape recovery. It's a K-shape recovery. No, mm, okay. Well, now to be clear, um, there's nothing particularly unusual about that statement. Every recession has a K-shaped recovery because every recession, for the most part, um, low-skilled people do worse than high-skilled people. 
There's no new there. There's no information. That's exactly what happens. One of the reasons we like to make sure our kids have a good education is because they are better able to handle economic uncertainty, right? Now, to be clear, I just said all recessions are K-shaped. Well, there's one exception, this one. <laughs> this is not a K-shaped recovery. In fact, this is the only non-K-shaped recovery we've ever seen. Low-skilled workers are doing great. They're doing great. Their wage growth has never slowed down. Wage growth for low-skilled workers has remained higher than a high-skilled worker right through this situation, as the case may be. Um, look on the left-hand side, earnings growth by hour. Part-time folks have seen their wages grow faster than full-time, or not faster, but almost as fast as full-time folks. First time that's happened in decades. Uh, on the right-hand side, wage gains by quartile. The lowest quartile has seen the biggest wage gains. In other words, Believe it or not, for those of you who are worried about income inequality, may I present the solution? No, it's, it's not about minimum wages. It's about tight labor markets. And the tight labor markets are doing a hell of a good job helping low-skilled folks get ahead. And by the way, we should be happy about that. We should applaud that. Now, if you're a business that hires a lot of low-skilled folks, yeah, you're going to have to do some rebuilding of your, of your cost model, as the case may be. Because again, this isn't going to change. But if you're worried about the broader social issues of inequality, be happy. Because this, this is shifting the needle. Um, now, for everything I said is true for the United States. Of course, in California, we have one other problem. You remember housing or lack of housing? Well, again, for all the problems in the United States, we've compounded ours because we won't build enough housing. And with that in mind, you know, I can go through all this. You've seen it all before. Here's the point. Um, Last year, the sixth, on a percentage basis, California had the sixth largest out-migration of people. And, and I can tell you, most of the places they're migrating out of, North Dakota, Illinois, Ohio, uh, most of New York, I agree, I wouldn't want to live there either, right? <laughs> but, but they're not leaving California because they don't want to live here. They're leaving California because there's no place for them to live, okay? Now, this, of course, is a problem because we shouldn't be forcing people out of the state because of our unwillingness to build. And, of course, it's making the labor shortage problem that much worse. And, by the way, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you growth in earnings in California versus the rest of the United States. And, actually, if you look carefully, you'll see, actually, California is even, even bigger wages increases in, uh, in earnings for low-skilled workers. In other words, the inequality problem, which was worse here, is now becoming even better here relative to the rest of the United States because we won't build enough housing. So understand what you're dealing with. And again, remember, it's not going anywhere. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about housing. Again, what did we hear? Oh, well, the world was going to fall apart. 30% of homeowners are going to stop paying their mortgage, right? It's going to be a meltdown. Then within two months, the housing market went crazy. Uh, sales were up. Everybody's trying to buy. Um, prices are through the roof. Uh, boy, I got to update some of these numbers, but I, the, the recent numbers came out this morning. Uh, to the, like the median price was up 30 or 20 percent or something like that over the last year. Crazy numbers. Um, and it's not going anywhere. Yes, sales have slowed down, but they're slowing down because there's nothing to buy, not because there's a lack of demand. Uh, inventories are incredibly tight, tighter than they've been even, even in the middle of that crazed run-up to the Great Recession. Um, Housing is starting to increase. One of the strong sectors is housing construction. There's no doubt about it. Prices in California can cross the board. Up, up, up. By the way, for those of you trying to desperately take pictures, we're going to make PDFs available to you. Don't worry about it. Um, so, yeah, up, 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 up. Um, why? Is it a bubble? Are things out of control? No, no, it's not a bubble, okay? The reason the housing market got so strong so quickly was in part some short-run drivers, but really what I would call long-run drivers. Um, when we came into the pandemic, we had about a year and a half, two years of a weak housing market. Now, there were a lot of folks who were talking about housing was going to cause a recession. You remember that? Um, <clears throat> it's funny. At the beginning of 2019, 80% of the economists who contributed to the Wall Street Journal were saying we were going to have a recession in the next two years. They weren't talking about the pandemic. Nobody knew what COVID was in the beginning of 2019. They were talking about interest rates and housing and the trade war. Um, now, again, why would you say that? Well, the market was cool. Yeah, but that's not why a housing market collapses. It collapses because there's fundamental problems. The fundamentals of housing were fine. Now, it had slowed, but it slowed because interest rates had come up. 
Um, and that, of course, by itself means, it, and oh, we had the changes in tax policy under the Trump tax plan. You know, you can't write off everything as much, right? Now, when that happens, of course, the market has to re-equilibrate, and it slows down a bit. But the thing about housing is the feedback effect, which is so profound, right? The reality is, is, let's say you're thinking about buying a house. Well, if no one's really buying a house, you're not in any particular rush. So a slow market creates a slower market. Now, the opposite occurs, too. When you're thinking about buying a house and you can't buy a house, you become panicked. And so what you had was this kind of this equilibrium slowing it down. We hit COVID. Suddenly, it, low interest rates are back in a big way. And oh, by the way, everybody's got money in their bank account because they're not spending and the government's giving them checks hand over fist. And of course, by the way, you're stuck in your house with your three and five year old and realizing how small your house is. <laughs> and you know, hey, listen, I want to get a house. I want it to be about, you know, 2,800 square feet, but I want the kids room to be a quarter mile from my office. Can you do that? <laughs> um, and so everybody started buying. And then immediately, as soon as they started buying, Inventories were tight, there's nothing available, people get panicked. And you know, I, had a, I have a buddy of mine who's been trying to buy a home. He's going to homes and there's 50 offers. It's nuts, right? Now again, it's not a bubble. Why is it not a bubble? Well, here's one reason. Mortgages are clean. There's no subprime driving the market. 85% of mortgage originations right now are going to people above a 720 credit score, that's clean. More important is look at owner costs on the right-hand side. And this is by state. We, you know, one of the big myths in the run-up to this pandemic was the myth of expensive U.S. housing. We have a crisis in the U.S. Everything's too expensive. I don't know how you would say that. Take a look on the right-hand side. The top is people who are non-housing cost constrained, and the bottom are housing cost constrained. Take California. In 2011, almost 40% of homeowners were housing cost constrained. By 2019, despite Despite the huge increase in prices from 2011 to 2019, that number went from 38% to 28%. It went down, not up. We're not housing cost constrained in California. And I know you can say, well, how can you say that? Prices are up so high. You gotta remember that when you don't have enough housing for sale because you're not building enough, only the richest people win the bidding war and they can afford it. The price doesn't bother them. The problem are the people who can't buy because I just got outbid by the rich guy. So, so this is not, it's not an affordability problem, it's a supply problem. You want people to have an opportunity to live in California, you can't subsidize it, you have to build it. And building it means, yeah, maybe our neighborhood's gonna have to change, right? But again, we can't come to grips with this conversation. Um, Rents, they're fine. Uh, out here in the Inland Empire, they didn't even slow down. They, they, they glitched a little bit in LA and Orange County, many because down on areas. Vacancy rates, nice and steady. Now again, the big story where everybody's about to get evicted, hundreds of thousands of people in California about to get evicted. I, I don't know on what basis they possibly come up with that. There's not one statistic that would support that hypothesis, that idea. I've showed you all the numbers. So, accounts are up, incomes are up. Unemployment's good, labor markets are good. Where is this huge pool of people who are about to get evicted? And of course, you look at the data from the National uh, uh, Multifamily Housing Council, a couple percent aren't paying. That's it. Now, so they'll tell you, all the people say, well, that, that doesn't count because that's only big units. Well, I don't know. Uh, what, what, people are less likely to not pay in big apartment buildings than small ones? Now, I have seen some broader data. What's really interesting is the highest share of non-payment is for single family rentals. Now, that's kind of important, right? Single family rentals, those are the well-heeled renters. When the well-heeled renters are not paying, I start to think, maybe this is strategic. Maybe you're saying, you know, I want to buy a house, and look, I can live here free for a year and a half. I mean, I could save $80,000, $90,000 screwing the guy who owns this place. Why not? Why not? Even, even this program, um, uh, this, uh, that, that uh, uh, Newsom's been, you know, he wants to pay people's rent, right? He's got a huge pool of money. They've allocated. We'll help you catch up. You've heard about this program? Now, why isn't it, why, why is there money there? Why isn't it flying out the door? Well, you know, there's two sets of forms that have to be turned into the government, from the landlord and from the tenant. 
Now, the landlord has to simply prove that I haven't been paid. And by the way, landlords are perfectly happy to prove they haven't been paid, okay? They are perfectly, the state is chock full of documents saying this landlord hasn't been paid. The funny thing is, you know who's not filling in the documents? The tenants. Now, the tenants have to prove that they're having economic hardship. Yet, for some reason, they don't seem to be able to fill out that form, which is surprising because you'd think they have lots of time on their hand, wouldn't you? Now, again, I'm not suggesting that everybody out there who's not paying is, is a scoff law. I'm not saying that. I know a share of them are truly having problems. And I think the government has a duty to help those people. But clearly, it is not a system-wide problem. It's not. And to continue to pretend it is, you're doing more harm than good. You're doing more harm than good. As for permits, uh, it was, oh, 2020 was okay. It looks a little better in 2021 out here. But again, nowhere near what it needs to be. Nowhere near what it was in 2006 when the Inland Empire was building a lot of housing. Uh, you look out here, housing availability is incredibly low. Um, you need housing. Now, the Inland Empire historically has been the place of housing supply. But the Inland Empire has picked up some bad habits from Orange County and L.A. And now what used to be the source of growth is, of course, becoming yet again another issue for Southern California and our inability to have enough housing to meet demand, which is leading to the labor shortages, which is causing businesses such conniptions. Again, I can't tell you enough. It's the business community that has to weigh in heavily on Sacramento to get them to understand it's build, build, build. That is the solution to these problems, as simple as that. Now, where are the risks? for housing at this point in time. Well, the biggest risk, of course, is interest rates. And interest rates, of course, as would be driven by issues with inflation, which in turn has to come from conversations about the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, yet again, has come a little bit, uh, what I would call, unglued, uh, I guess would be the charitable way of putting it. Um, look, I, I mean, Jerome Powell, who, you know, bless his soul, is a lawyer, not an economist. Um, and to be clear, I don't have a problem with lawyers. I don't think I'd want one fixing my toilet or operating on my appendix. And I don't think I want one running my Federal Reserve. But that's the choice we made. And lo and behold, as opposed to doing the economic thing, he did the lawyer, th lawyer thing. And he said, well, it w worked for Ben Bernanke and Jenna Yellen works for me. I'm going to go ahead and toss a few trillion dollars in quantitative easing at the economy. But folks, Janet Yellen and... Ben Bernanke had a real problem on their hand. They had a collapse in household wealth. They had massive problems in the US debt system. These are massively deflationary, and yes, you have to pour money into the economy to offset it. You had to do trillions of dollars of quantitative easing just to keep things steady. We don't have banking problems. There are no debt problems. Look at debt delinquencies over there. They don't exist. They don't exist. Household net worth is going through the roof because the stock market's second highest P.E. ratio and home prices are going up. He's fighting a war that doesn't exist. Now again, sounds good on paper until you, of course, see the inflation rate. Now I know, I know, it's transitory. It's transitory. It's just because of these supply problems. Everything's okay here. Nothing to see. Move along, folks. It's all fine and good. Well, listen, I appreciate in the short run, much of the inflation we're seeing is being driven by the supply chain issues. But just because that is the case doesn't mean long run inflation, the dangerous inflation isn't going to occur. In fact, take a look on the left hand side here. Um, the blue line there is what we call unit money supply. Unit money supply is more or less the amount of money divided by the nominal transactions, nominal GDP as the case may be. Uh, if you go back to, um, uh, uh, the early part of the late 60s and 70s when we had inflation, you could see that number was running about 10 to 1. Now, after uh, uh, Volcker came in, that number dropped and dropped and dropped until it got to a low about 6 in the early 90s. And then it started to pick up again. And we had more money supply, and we didn't see inflation. But then again, with that low unit money supply, why would you? But look what happened over the last year. We, we, went, we were getting close to 10, where we were in the 70s, and this huge amount of money into the system jacked that up to about 12. Now, here's, here's the basic thing, just two basic things to keep in mind. A, we have to be humble at some level. Forecasting inflation is incredibly hard, okay? It just is. It's one of the hardest things 
I have to do as an economist. It's hard. But the other thing is this. Don't sit there and tell me inflation's not a risk when you are in uncharted territory. When you have that much money floating around relative to the size of economy, uh-uh. No, 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 no. You can't say inflation's not a problem with that number. You can't. And to do so is irresponsible. So yes, we do have inflation risks big time. And boy, if inflation does pick up, eventually the bond market's going to get whacked, and they're going to see those interest rates up, and that's going to be bad for real estate, but it's also bad for something else. One of the reasons we don't care about the trillions of dollars in government borrowing is the debt burden isn't going up, because even as they're borrowing tons and tons of money, the amount of money they have to spend on that is going lower and lower. So overall, federal interest payments as a percent of GDP, nice and steady. But remember, a lot of the federal debt is short term. What happens if interest rates go through the roof? What happens to that debt burden? We already have tons of debt. We have a huge problem with Medicare, Social Security, and here we are begging to see the interest payments go through the roof. And again, no one's talking about it. There, there's no conversation. They poo-poo you if you even bring it up. So yeah, I'm really worried about the consequences of what we're doing. We're all sitting around worried about a crisis that doesn't exist, and we're completely poo-pooing the crisis that does. This is not a good trend. It's just not. Um, so watch out for that. Watch out for the potential there. Again, it's going to be a good run, but eventually, if inflation kicks in the way I fear it might, it's going to be a big hit to our economy. The debt problem, the federal debt problem, is going to become a real big problem real quick. So yeah, there is enormous landmine sitting out there in front of us, two, three, four, five years. I'm not sure. But it's out there, and don't pretend it doesn't exist. Now, with that in mind, we're talking about real estate. I want to talk a little about commercial. Now, not because I want to get in the nuts and bolts of commercial per se. We know basically what's going on. First of all, the market's fine. If the sales are up. Uh, the, you can borrow money again, no problem. There's no issues in debt, no issues there. Um, overall, what I want to talk about is what's going to happen with, with commercial. Now, industrial, you know, it's proven its worth. You're industrial, you're having a great year. You just want to build more because these local transport's fantastic. Retail is doing surprisingly okay. Now, mind you, they weren't doing well in the first place. They were already suffering, but at least they kind of had an idea of what they needed to do, and they were moving along trying to get there, right? Office is the real interesting thing because, of course, of the work from home trends. Now, um, how to think about this? Well, first of all, look, folks, we have too much retail. We've had too much retail, and with more and more sales going online, it's time for the state to finally say, look, we have too much retail. And I appreciate how local governments love retail because they need taxable sales. But Again, taxable sales are going to be generated through warehouses. They're not going to be generated as much through brick and mortar. And it's time for us to acknowledge that. I have a simple solution for the governor, which kills two birds with one stone. How about, as opposed to worrying about subdividing single family lots, how about you pass a nice simple rule? From here on out, anything zoned retail in the state of California will be rezoned mixed use retail residential. Amen. All right? How many problems will that solve? Right? Love to see it. Um, but office, office is really important to think about for the Inland Empire and, and, and North Orange County. I'm sorry, I keep saying IE. I have to appreciate my, 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 my Orange County folks here as well. But North Orange County, because again, it's a separate kind of conversation. Look, <clears throat> prior to the pandemic, about 10% of office work days will work from home. During the pandemic, 60%. Post-pandemic surveys suggest about 30%. Now, not everybody. It's not going to be everybody. In fact, they did a survey. I love this survey. Um, about 27% of people said, I want to work from the I would never want to go to the office. I work from home all the time. 33% said, I don't want to be more at home more than one day a week. Okay? 33% who have little kids. We all know that, okay? <laughs> by the way, I have a three and a five year old. Could you tell by my comment times here? But, but why do I bring this up? Well, look, the, the story at the beginning of this thing was that the downtown was dead. We all heard how San Francisco's never coming, coming back. And my, by the way, the press is amazed that San Francisco's coming back. Again, whatever. Um, but there is something important here. Let's say, look, you've you got to realize downtowns exist for a reason, okay? They do. Now, I, what, what do you, well, of course they do. They're right there, Chris. What are you talking about? Yeah, but, but they have to exist for a reason. And what I mean by that is, look, if you locate your business downtown, what, what are you dealing with? Well, it's a tough commute for your employees. You know that, right? And, and by the way, you're paying a lot of money because rent's way more expensive downtown than it is in the burbs. Yet for some reason, businesses flock to this expensive place. Clearly, there's something valuable to being downtown. 
Now, in economists speak, we call it external economies of scale. You're close to your clients. You're close to your vendors. You're, you have an access to a liquid labor market. There's good panache, good visibility. There's all sorts of reasons to be downtown. And businesses find those assets, those values, greater than the cost of being there. But there's an equilibrium. Now, work with me for a second. Imagine everybody downtown is suddenly going from having 10% work from home to 30% work from home. What happens to the office space downtown? It empties out, right? And if it empties out, what happens to rents? They go down. And if they go down, what happens to that equilibrium? Well, it's now cheaper to be downtown, which means more businesses are going to go downtown. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the Inland Empire has a problem. Well, the problem you know about is, for some reason, we don't have these nice jobs the way Irvine and downtown LA does. Where are the lawyers? Where's the tech companies? Where are my professionals? Where are my consultants? Why aren't they out here? Why are we a low-wage community? What is going on? Well, the answer, by the way, is very simple. Those jobs are in downtowns. That's where they are. They're in downtown Irvine. They're in downtown LA. They're in that Glendale, Pasadena corridor. They're in West LA. There is no dense job zones in the Inland Empire. That's why you don't have these jobs. The, the region has gone out of its way to maintain a suburban framework, but the result of that is you have suburban jobs. Now, part of the Inland Empire, part of its growth is to move beyond the suburb. This is the 13th largest labor force in the nation. It is an incredibly powerful dynamic economy that for some reason relies on Orange County and LA for these top-level business services. Now, <laughs> this area needs to have that. But the only way you're going to have that is by building the downtown. Riverside's getting there. Ontario still hasn't figured it out. San Bernardino is a jewel in the rough. But it needs a lot of work to get there. But the first thing we all have to do in this room is accept the fact that the Inland Empire has a density problem. And it isn't too much density, it's not enough density. And at some level, there has to be the community conversation about how, yet again, to change the dynamics of local permitting and local investment to allow these downtowns to come to the Inland Empire to make this economy, to make this place what it should be. You're not a suburb of Orange County in LA. You're bigger than Baltimore. You're, you're as big as Denver. You're bigger than Tampa. These guys all have professional sports teams. Why don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so think about that. And think about how, yet again, this pandemic has not created new normals, but it has accelerated trends that are already there, and it's trends you have to pay attention to to make this place what it should be. I've talked too long and I apologize. Let's wrap it up. Folks, the economy's back. The V was the only logical thing that was going to happen. Recovery is done. We're going to have an overheated economy for the next couple years. Labor markets are incredibly tight. They're not going away. It's good for workers. Inequality is going to be falling as a result of this. All good stuff. But in the end, the biggest problem is a problem we had before the pandemic showed up. This disconnect, this miserableism, this constant need for us to run around telling everybody the end is nigh, the sky is falling, when it's not. We've never lived in better times than we do right now. We have problems, but to address those problems, we first have to appreciate where we are and what we do have, and then we can turn around and focus on what really needs to take place. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the very beginning of this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting these chambers. And continue to do that, because this is where we can change the narrative and make the story right so that we can start focusing on the things that we need to do as an economy. Thank you very much. Chris, 
I want to thank you very much for taking the responsibility to come up here and share your insights with us today. Uh, I think we can all kind of agree that we see lots of opportunity here. I know that's the reason why we, as a group, formed this together. And so I really appreciate your sentiment on that. So let's give Chris Thornburg a round of applause, everybody. I know he mentioned he'll be around to answer some questions. So if you have any personal questions for Chris, I know he'll be here for a little while at least. So uh, you're available to do that. And then lastly, I want to thank our sponsors. You know, uh, once again, we want to say thank you. This is not something that we could have done without you. We we're able to bring this to you. Uh, so I really want to thank our sponsors. So if you're a sponsor, thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause for our sponsors. And then lastly, we know you're all very extremely busy people, but we felt it was extremely important to get all of you in the room together to start ha or to continue to have these discussions about improving our region and our area. So I want to thank you guys all for making it out here today. Uh, and for your continued support of our Chamber Business Alliance, our mutual interest in North Orange County, Western Riverside County, and San Bernardino County regions. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, have a safe drive home. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Yes. Okay. One last comment real quick. The centerpieces, which are the flowers, would go to our sponsors. So again, thank you very much, sponsors. Have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you.